time here. Videos on, videos on, and we're golden. Mm-hmm. Awesome. How's it going? Okay. Not too shabby. How are you? Very good. Very good. Not too shabby as well. Can't complain. You got quite the office there. Oh, well, it's at the. Uh, it's uh, the. Unfortunately, my uh, laptop has the uh, camera located in a ridiculous place right above the keyboard. So you're getting. A, if I t tilt it right, you don't get that much of a view of my chin, but I can't avoid it. No worries. Entirely. No worries. It's a. Uh... I, I remember learning something about high pictures versus low pictures to make people look creepy or cool. I can't remember which was which, though, so we'll hope this is the cool one. Right. Do you have the ability to record on your side? Are you Mac? Uh, no, um, but I think I, I I think, let's see, what is that? Um, microphone, speakers, I think, isn't there in Sp Skype some ability to do this? Skype there is, so I'm recording it right now on my side. Um, do you have Windows? Yes. Try try clicking the search icon and then typing in sound recorder. And if that doesn't work, I've got mm -hmm. it on my side anyway. So it's just nice to have a backup in case. I have voice recorder. Oh, voice recorder. Perfect. That's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, let it access microphone. Yes. Um, so now it appears to be on. Do I just click it? Yeah, you click it. I imagine there'll be some type of heartbeat looking deal just showing you the yeah. on. Okay, it seems to be on, so I'll just minimize it, and here we go. Awesome. So, super excited to have you on. In terms well, of, thank you. In terms of how it works, we'll do a little bit of uh, introduction, but most of that will be in the post-production. Mm -hmm. And then it's, yeah, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty easy conversation. You seem great, like quite a smart guy that has a really interesting background, so I think it'll be fun. Oh, well, thank you. Any questions on your side about anything before we start it? Sure. How long do you, um, do you typically have? How if, long do these typically last for? If What's we, the duration? Yeah. If we have a hard stop, we can hit it, but typically they're around an hour. Okay. Sound good? No, I don't have a hard stop. I just was uh, kind of curious about what, what kind of enterprise I was in, in for. Yeah. It's not, not quite Joe Rogan, but definitely not the 10 minute TED Talk. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, that's probably good. Joe Rogan, I sometimes uh, – I had a friend who was on his uh, show, and I think they talked for like five hours or something. It was ridiculous. <laughs> Better have some coffee for that. Yeah. yeah. Or, or the Elon Musk into a little weed something. <laughs> Got to keep <laughs> right. it interesting, right? Well, thanks uh, Thanks right. for coming. Ready to do this? Yeah. Awesome. And it's, is it man or man? Man. Okay, man. We got the American just expression. This, right, right. Just the straightforward Midwestern man. Perfect. Let's do, I'll do it. I can do the accent as well. Yeah, right. Okay, this should be recording and we should be good. Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get, let's face it, the world's most interesting folks to talk about the future. Today we got somebody who's doing that and more, also looking backwards, Charles Mann on the program. Thanks for coming today, Charles. That's my pleasure. So I'm I'm super excited to have you on because you kind of have looked at that past and future clash of humanity. So I wanted to quickly hit your background before we dive into that big and deep topic. Okay, well, basically, I'm a science journalist. I mean, that's where I got my start. I've worked for Science, The Atlantic, Wired, you know, The Atlantic uh, Monthly, I think I said, National Geographic. It's over for a long time, but mostly right now I write books. And uh, if you've ever heard of me before, it's likely because uh, I wrote a book called 1491. Uh, which is about the Americas before Columbus. And then there is a sort of a bookend book called 1493, which is about what happened afterwards. And most recently, I wrote The Wizard and the Prophet, which is about ways that people think about the environment and uh, the environmental questions that are facing us in the future. Which is really the big topic today. I want to talk about The Wizard and the Prophet a little bit, because you kind of talked about these two people who both have a great idea on how to make the future better and are pretty much killing each other because of it. How do, yes. what's, the, what's the future look like? How do we survive 10 billion? Okay, so the idea is that there's going to be roughly 10 billion people in 2050, and so we're going to have to feed everybody, get water to everybody, get power to everybody, and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So how are we going to do that? And, you know, as a journalist um, and writer, I've been asking that question to scientists, researchers, adv uh, advocates, politicians, you name it, for, you know, a couple of decades. And after a while, I realized their answers fell into two broad categories. Um, each, uh, at least in my mind, associated with a dead guy nobody's ever heard of. And I nicknamed these guys the Wizard and the Prophet. And I can go on about this more. Do you want to hear it or, or should I stop Yeah, let, let's go on about it a little more. Yeah. How do we make okay. the Wizard and the Prophet into a Gandalf? That's a little okay. of both. 
<laughs> well, that's a problem. Um, so the wizard in, uh, is a guy named Norman Borlaug, and uh, he's a name that I think more people should uh, should know. Uh, he's the leading figure in what's been called the Green Revolution, which is the combination of um, you know high yielding seeds, high intensity fertilizer, and irrigation that doubled, tripled, or even quadrupled grain yields around the world in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And largely, though not entirely, because of the Green Revolution. Um, and the sort of changes associated with that, the pro, uh, projections of disastrous famine that were common in the 1960s just simply didn't uh, come true. And in fact, the world has largely been in a period without famine for the first time, so far as we know, in human history. And the uh, lesson that many, many people drew from this is that science and technology properly applied can let you produce your way out of um, your, your problems. You know, you put, you put on your thinking cap, you think about the right kind of technical solution, and, you've, and you can fix the, the problem without fundamentally changing the rest of um, society. In other words, you, you do what you're doing, but smarter and, and, and more. And so, you know, quite often when you talk to people, they say, I want to do what Borlaug did for wheat, but for X, whatever X is. Um, now, there are some real downsides to the, uh, to, to the Green Revolution, and they led to um, a sort of simultaneous reaction to the, in the opposite direction. And that's um, led by a guy that's even more obscure. His name is William Vogt. And he is the guy who put together the sort of fundamental ideas behind the environmental movement, which is the, I would argue, is the only enduring ideology that's come out of the 20th century. Um, and the fundamental idea of the environmental movement is that the world has limits. There, and these limits are set by ecological processes, and we transgress, we've surpassed those limits to our peril. And Vogt is the first guy who put the, all this together, and he wrote the first modern We're All Going to Hell book um, back in 1948. And if you read any kind of environmentalist stuff, it all comes back to, to Vogt. And his idea is you have to stay within the boundaries, stay within the margins, learn how to live in the system that we're in and embed ourselves in it more successfully. And if you think about it, these two approaches are kind of the opposite of each other. And uh, Vogt and Borlaug met once. Uh, they both got their ideas in the same place at the same time, which was uh, Mexico in the 1940s, which was really in a desperate uh, position then. And uh, they hated each other. They, as far as I can tell, they never spoke after the one time they met. I want to, And that's kind of where the discourse has been ever since. And it, it's, it's gotten worse and worse thanks to social yeah. media. Can you pull the mic back just a little? There's a little bit of a mic pop. And uh, okay. this is uh, it's super interesting. So basically, we can kind of trace the origin of these divergent opinions. But I would argue you can almost think about it more in terms of values than you can in terms mm -hmm. of opinions. So yeah. w when you would you characterize the wizard as more or less an abundance optimist mindset? Yeah. And I mean, they certainly recognize that there are problems, but they say, you know, by applying individual human brain power, by maximizing individual human liberty, we can, you know, create a, a certain kind of utopia for, our, for, for ourselves. And the other guys see this as abhorrent, um, in addition to being wrong. You know, they see human beings as fundamentally sort of social creatures. We live in communities. We need to, um, you know, make our communities better, make them closer to the earth. And they see this as more democratic. Um, more egalitarian. And this is, in a way, uh, you know, a modern version of debates that go back to Jefferson and Hamilton, you know, who fought about whether we should live in cities or live in um, small um, villages like Jefferson wanted. Um, it goes back to Malthus and Condorcet. So th these are, this is an ancient um, fight that's now got this modern form about, you know, what are we going to do in the world of uh, 10 billion? What is that world going to look like? And it has a lot to do with what we think is good. And no one has any freaking idea on how we're going to do that. What uh, what are some of the trends you're seeing? And is there a way to re unite these two parties who kind of view the... Because uh, this isn't something where they're diametrically opposed in terms of you're a Nazi and I'm a whatever. This mm -hmm. is something in terms of I have a good idea and you have a good idea. But our good ideas kind of have different impetuses behind them. So your idea is suddenly evil. Right. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, take GMOs. Now, the, there, there's certainly the case, those are genetically modified um, organisms, and there's a big fight in agriculture about them. Um, the backdrop of this is that um, most researchers believe that when we, by the time we get to 2050, um, we're going to um, need to grow roughly twice as much food as we do today. And that's for two reasons. The first is that there's a 
you know, 800 million people or so who don't have enough to eat and we need to um, provide food for them, you know. Uh, and the second is that as people get more affluent and the world is getting more more affluent, they tend to want to eat more meat. And meat takes more crops to produce than, you know, simply eating, you know, um, ve vegetables and grains. And so the... Uh, you know, the Borlogians, if you like, I know that I don't use that word very much because it sounds like something out of Star Trek, you know, the Borlogian ambassador, Captain, you know, that sort of thing. But the wizards say, look, this is what people want. They want to eat more meat. It's our job to try and figure out how to how to produce more so we can get what people want. The prophets say, well, people may want this, but it's unsustainable. It, uh, it's a disaster. And what we need to do is, you know, eat less meat and uh, grow more more vegetables and waste less. And so the two kinds of approaches, one that involves remodeling, uh, you know, remolding society in a better way, and the other one that says that society is fine the way it is, we just need to figure out a technical solution to allow us to do it, um, have led to a tremendous amount of clashing over uh, GMOs. And the reason is, is that the wizards see this as the sort of the answer, you know, that you, what you're doing is re-engineering crops and animals and so forth to be hyper-productive. And uh, the um, prophets see this as you know, we already have an industrial agricultural system that they don't like, they think is destructive to the human spirit, and now you're just intensifying it and going further along that path. Of course they don't like it. And so there's been a fight now for 20 or 30 years over this. I think the GMO thing is something that people don't understand. It's kind of, you can have GMOs or you can have kids, but you can't have both. And you especially <laughs> can't have both if you're in a lower income. Now, we've kind of discussed it a bit on the podcast before. I think people's misunderstanding or characterization of GMOs is bad is actually a derivative of the pesticides that they facilitate mm -hmm. in use. My understanding is Roundup, et cetera, is actually pretty destructive for the bacteria in your gut. So a lot of the health consequences people think about aren't actually a consequence of eating something where I did this little snip with this CRISPR deal over here mm -hmm. and made my broccoli twice as tasty. It's the stuff that was getting sprayed on that killing all the good bacteria in my stomach. Well, it's, it's, it's really, really complicated because um, what the GMOs do is change the kinds of chemicals that, that, that get used. Um, for example, when you have uh, BT cotton, which is a cotton that has um, genes from a bacterium, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, I think is how you pronounce it, um, spliced in that repels um, insects. And uh, the result is that you use way less pesticides. Um, so good, right? Um, but on the other hand, uh, GMO crops tend to, because they're hyperproductive, um, tend to use way more fertilizer, use way more water, um, and and so that's that's a problem in in and of itself. So there's this very complicated thing that's going on that people kind of simplify to a moral um, thing is you know should we be tinkering with nature in the, in 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 this way, and. You know, we are moral creatures. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean that the debate is less about the science than about what you think is right. What about clean meat? Have your cow and eat it too. <laughs> I mean, like the artificial meat, like the Impossible yeah. Burger? Exactly. Um, not, not, mm, I'm not sure if that one's the, not necessarily the soy-derived ones, but the ones where they're clinically lab-growing it. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's <clears throat> it's it's completely fascinating. It's it's hard for me to believe um, that they'll be able to do that on a really large scale and in places like India or um, you know poor parts of Asia that uh, you know are the places that are where meat can meat and dairy product consumption is rapidly rising. You know, I've eaten um, some of them and they're 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 fine. It's going to be a long time before they're translated into something that a that a you know a, a, a villager in Thailand is going to is is going to have. Um, it's, maybe it's possible, but that would require a really crash uh, program and probably some national commitment. So in terms of the, the wizard profit debate, a big part of what I hear is one wants to kind of roll with the punches and go the way that society is going, but optimize it. And the other yeah. wants to get people to change. And as, as an entrepreneur, the worst thing you can ever try to do in the world is to try to educate people or get them to change because humans are humans are fat and lazy and happy. And it's pretty darn hard to change those states. Is it almost fair to say that short of an apocalypse, it would be impossible to go profit model? Or not profit well, in terms of like the Muhammad profit, not profit in terms of making money. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Yet at the same time, um, our lives have dramatically changed. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, 
uh, look at the tremendous presence of social media in our in our in our lives. That was something that didn't exist 15 years ago. Look at uh, smartphones. I mean, it's really possible to find all kinds of technologies uh, like like this. Um, it's also rapid. The example I would give is that uh, take slavery. Um, this is an absolutely foundational institution for humankind. The oldest legal code that we know of, I think, is the Code of Hammurabi, you know, which is uh, from several thousand years BC. And if you read it, um, which you can read it on the internet, um, about a third of it has to do with rules for slavery. You know, it's a, it's a code basically regulating how you can buy and sell and use uh, people. Um, and that gives you some idea of how foundational this institution is. There's no society that we know of that had no um, type of um, sl slavery. And yet, in a few decades, in the early 19th century, this thing that had been existed for all of human history was effectively made illegal all over the world. Today, although the International Labor Organization will tell you there's you know, 27 million or 29 million or whatever the number is slaves in the world, there is no part of the world in which it's a legal and accepted part of society the way it was everywhere in the world in 1800. And so this is a huge trans, um, change that people that people made. Um, similarly, uh, you know, look at the uh, role for women. Um, you know, back in 1800, there's no country in the world in which a woman could get rid of an abusive husband. There's no country in the world in which a woman could vote. There's no country in the world in which a woman could have a bank account, you know, and on and on and on. They couldn't go to college and so forth, except for possibly a very, very small number of elite women. Um, and now, you know, that's that's all dramatically changed. And it happened because a few um, suffragists um, in the late 19th, you know, half uh, late 19th century and earlier 20th century was willing to risk ridicule and put themselves on the line. And we had these so these tremendous changes in human society. They're very much against the will of, <laughs> of many of the people involved. So what you're saying is absolutely true. But we also have these uh, these major, major counterexamples. I mean, a truism in, in anthropology is that, you know, from the as far as we know, there has never been a society in which women ruled, um, this, you know, a, mat a true matriarchy. Um, and yet today, um, more vote, more women vote in the United States than men, more women going to college in the United States than men and, and so on. But at the same time, a lot of those changes were something where it would kind of be like getting the entire U.S. to collectively have to lose 100 million pounds. Everybody's mm -hmm. got to drop a third versus taking 10 million and saying you guys need to drop a hundred million pounds. The it's so it's a strange and metaphor, but it's the it's kind of the tragedy that commons reversed mm -hmm. because it doesn't affect anyone all that much to make those positive changes. Well, okay, I I have to get rid of I like the slavery example that mm -hmm. pretty much helped a lot of people and didn't really help very or didn't really hurt very many except for the ones at top. But to, to well, yeah, but those are the powerful ones. <laughs> They are, but they were the powerful ones in the South who were the suckers who were had already lost the war. Yeah. So, like to, to to flip it around to try to make the changes that we're talking about today would be something that would hit everybody. If suddenly, I mean, if you suddenly you banned fast food in America, you would have a revolt because people wouldn't know what to do. Suppose people yeah. can't feed themselves, but that's another story. But I, I think I would I would say put it this way, um, you know, something like. Um, my wife is an architect and uh, and builder and very interested in sustainable design and the people involved in the in the you know the built environment will tell you that something like 30 percent or 35 percent of the emissions we make um, are in one way or another involved with the, the the built environment and to change that involves a bunch of regulatory uh, changes you know it includes changing the standards the zoning standards um, of, of cities it includes um, changing the way that houses are built, and change, you know, in terms of insulation and so forth, it means um, <clears throat> altering the way the utilities provide power and so forth. And these will have huge effects on the on the world, but it you know it's not clear that they would have huge effects on middle class houses. I live in a house that she designed that's effectively zero emissions. It's not like I'm living in some bizarro you know war, you know wildly different thing on a, on a day to day basis. It's that these there's a whole host of changes that are relatively invisible to me that makes our house in a certain way more like a profit stream. Um, and so a lot of those changes could could take place without. Um, you know, having dram dr dramatic impact. You How do we do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, for example, um, you know, the, if you 
you know, a, a huge deal is energy efficiency. Actually, this is something that both wizards and prophets uh, uh, agree on. And what there are these arcane political struggles in states uh, that where various interest groups fight over energy efficiency standards. And you know whether you have to retrofit your uh, your 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 house or not, and what kind of aid that you get. And there's whole hosts of programs that if you want your have your house surveyed for gas, you know for for heat loss and and that sort of stuff, the state will pay for it for free. All of this um, everybody knows about, but these will represent actually a profound change in the way we do deal with the the built environment. Similarly, something like a cafe standard. Um, which is the uh, standard for um, oil, you know, for the amount of gas that you, your your car has to burn, and the you know the, the mileage um, standards. These can be tweaked in such a way that the the uh, manufacturers have to have to change them. And all this doesn't actually require dramatic changes in um, in 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 lifestyles. So. Similarly, the United States has been one of the leading, it's sort of strange to say, but the United States has been one of the leading countries in reducing its emissions um, of, of carbon dioxide. And that's largely because we've shut down a whole bunch of coal plants, um, you know, something like half the fleet in the last 10 or 15, 15 years has switched to gas, and so reduced our emissions by, by um, that much. And, you know, this did not cause a revolution on the streets. <laughs> You know, it made um, some utility owners pretty mad. But, you know, like you were saying, uh, with, with the slavery, the average person wasn't uh, affected by this, except for the, you know, the and, and, and the, the human health parts of it, in which the people near the coal plants um, are now having better air. So there's a lot that can be done that doesn't require, you know, totally dramatic, um, you know, shutting down of, uh, of fast foods and, and so forth. And uh, one way that you would uh, do this is, uh, you know, if you're if you're a wizard, you would say, well, well, let's keep the fast foods. We'll just make them, you know, plant based meat and, and so forth. And I've had the, them. They're pretty good. And I think a lot of people would go along with that. Uh, if you're a prophet, well, you say, well, OK, well, the fast foods are 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 all right. But let's make sure that they have um, lots and lots of really tasty other things to eat at, 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 as well. And both of those can probably go along. You know, McDonald's can probably live with either of those. Do we have to change? And kind of what I'm hearing is to make the changes we need to change require structural and incentive alignment shifts on a yeah. larger scale to make it plausible because of the nature of capitalism's profit-driven model. Yeah, and I think that's actually true for both uh, models. For example... Um, you know, I, I wouldn't regard either way of dealing with the future successful if in 2050 we continue to have, I think, what is it, 1.2 billion people without electricity. I mean, you know, electricity is a fundamental part of, of a contemporary existence. Uh, and you only have to go to a, a village in India that doesn't have electricity to realize that after six o'clock, you know, act, you know, when it gets dark, activity basically ceases and uh, kids can't do homework. People who come back from work can't go to the store because the stores don't have any lights in them. They're just on and on and on. And even very small amounts of electricity can make an enormous difference in people's lives. They can listen to a radio or, 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 or watch a television and, you know, get news from the, um, from, from the outside. So we have to provide electricity for those people. Right now, the incentives of capitalism are not uh, providing them because they're scattered around the rural people they don't have any they don't have any money on and on and on and uh, so if you're a wizard and you want to use nuclear power um, for example to uh, which is carbon free to um, reduce the amount of um, carbon in, in in the air when you provide electricity for you know uh, for one seventh of the world's people you want to provide it for uh, nuclear power you're going to have to somehow change it to reward the companies to actually build the lines out there to you know eastern kenya or central india or where wherever it is that you're talking about if you're a prophet and you want to um, say no we don't have nuclear energy we want to have distributed solar energy you still have to get the panels out there somehow you still have to build these microgrids that uh, that you like and both of those are um, right now with the rules that we have not reasonable things to do for companies or for states and that's why they haven't done it we've evolved beyond kingdoms we've evolved beyond feudalism many would argue we're evolving or have evolved beyond religion are we getting to the point where we've evolved beyond traditional capitalism is is the china model or something 
alternatively socialist communist with a bit of capitalism infused the answer going forward? I would, I would imagine that uh, you can find somebody who would call almost any arrangement that you have, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, some kind of social socialism. I mean, basically all capitalism does, is, is, is involves a particular way of marshalling resources. Um, you know, suppose you want to have coffee. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a nicotine junkie. Perhaps um, you have been known to drink some form of caffeine at some point in your life as 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 well. It doesn't grow. Coffee doesn't grow in the United States, except for a little bit in uh, in Hawaii. It will never grow in the United States. It's too cold. Um, and so you want to take coffee from Ethiopia, say, because you want to you know reward Ethiopian farmers. And that's also really tasty coffee. How are you going to do this? It's going to involve collecting lots and lots of individual farmers' um, coffee beans, putting them on some kind of conveyance, and bringing them over to the United States. Um, basic physics tells you that having zillions of little individual shipments is crazy and in, in, inefficient. You're going to put them in a giant ship or giant plane or what, whatever it is that you're going, going to use. You're going to have to mobilize resources to build that kind of thing. And it doesn't really matter whether it's socialist or communist. The physics um, and geography involved tell you that this you're going to have some version of this system. And um, so to me... You know what you're trying to do is uh, is to tweak that system in such a way that you get the maximum be benefits, and that typically involves some effort to um, harness the forces of the market in a way that is isn't destructive. And that's what's been going on for hundreds of years. I mean, there's never been a pure Ayn Rand style of capitalism, just as there's never been a pure pure socialism. It's always somewhere in the in in the middle. And the good thing is that it gives us a lot of tools in the box to, to work with. The closer we are to and Rand, though, wouldn't we have more issues the more nation states we have because of the whole collective good deal of I can pollute yeah. and it's less of a problem for me than it is for the profit I gain? Yeah. And uh, now the economists have recognized this for a long time. Um, you know, they call these externalities, right, where something I do benefits me, but it it makes everybody else um, worse off and the market doesn't capture that. And that's called an externality. And I believe the first textbook uh, on externalities was written in 1916. So this is a, a very, very well-known um, economic issue, even though apparently Anne Rand had, hadn't really under, uh, understood much uh, about that. And that's why we have, you know, uh, clean water rules and clean air air rules. And it's very difficult to me for me to imagine a society that wouldn't have those. You know, China, for instance, has often sort of tried to go along without them, and the result is that they have tens of thousands of environmental protests every, every year, and they've been forced um, into you know uh, to to enforcing those rules. It's uh it's interesting. How do we deal with a situation like the Paris Agreement then, where it is everyone kind of has the ability to drop out if they want to or pull a Trump. Uh, you know, for I have perhaps a, um, and I, you know, this is where you the moment where you confess your unpopular opinion. Um, so this is my unpopular um, op op opinion. I think it was stupid for Trump to do this, but I don't think it was as big a deal um, as, as as you might think. And the reason is that the climate problem. Um, although you know certainly global manifests itself locally in so many different uh, ways that it's very difficult to come up with a one size fits all and though even though that i think the paris talk framework is a really good and um and useful thing what's really happening in um our country and in um and in in the in the in the rest of the world is a mosaic of individual efforts you know uh pr probably far more important is the California Air Resources Board, which is uh, the one that determines air quality standards for, for um, California and is connected up with uh, the uh, now Gavin Newsom's advisors, which is called the Nifty 50. Um, and what the reason that that's important is that they have set uh, standards, emission standards for cars and 14 other states, uh, I think it's 14, it's 13 or 14, I can't remember, um, have agreed to go along with them, which covers about 45% uh, of the American automobile market. So even if Trump, <clears throat> you know, takes away from that, 
the California Air Resources um, Board and similar compacts, like there's one in um, New England, have enormous power to set things for um, their their respective their their respective regions. And so it's really important um, that we that we recognize all these different layers of efforts that go on into something uh, like co- combating uh, climate change. And remember that these giant global efforts are maybe less important than we think, even though it's you know they're, they're symbolically important but maybe less practically than we might think what do you think about the wizard solution of geoengineering india sees that their population and temperature are going to rise much too quickly and we have to fix this problem even though russia's real cool with it because it's making parts of siberia that totally suck livable how do we deal with a, a nation state or even a even a bezos just deciding to pull a wild card i'm actually quite worried about this um and uh you know, um, so what we're talking about is, uh, you know, something that you know, the most common way method of geoengineering is what they call SRM, solar radiation management. And that is you put something up in the um, stratosphere that reflects uh, a portion of the sunlight uh, way. The most commonly used one is, uh, or imagined, it's never been used, sorry, is uh, you, you take um, uh, so, uh, sulfur dioxide um, and you um, spray it up um, in the in the atmosphere combines with um, water vapor there and forms tiny glittering drops of dilute um, sulfuric acid and that reflects um, you know 15 20 percent of the um, sunlight away from the the, the earth and into, into space and we know in principle this could work uh, in 1991 a giant volcano blew up in the in the Philippines and did just that it sent about 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere and lowered the earth's temperature by about a degree degree and a half Fahrenheit for a couple of years so 20 million tons you know we know how to um, carry that up we have specialized delivery vehicles they're called 747s so we could put them up there it'd be better to have special purpose um, vehicles that could go up higher than 747s. But the point is, this is very eminently doable. And in fact, you could um, lower the Earth's, entire Earth's temperature um, by a degree or so for a couple billion dollars a year. So that Bill Gates could personally finance this if he wanted. Now, Forbes says there's 450 billionaires in the world. So there's like 400 private individuals who could who could do this. And uh, you know, look at look at Elon Musk. <laughs> do, do, do we think that legality would stop him if he got this in his mind? I don't. So I, I do worry about this. There's a wonderful um, book uh, by uh, Martin Weitzman and um, and Gernot Wagner called Climate Shock. And they talk about this and they, they, they call this the free driver problem. You know, free rider is 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 when it's so cheap for people to um, to do something that they just uh, that they just um, hop on and take advantage of other people's actions. And this, in this case, it's so cheap for people to do something that they can just do something completely renegade. And so they argue, I think, convincingly that this is quite likely. I mean, if you're in Indonesia and you see you know the sea level rising rapidly, are you gonna uh, are you gonna really worry about the sensibilities of other people? So um, this is something I'm quite worried about. And I think that the, this is a case where you really do want to have some kind of international governance. Because otherwise you have World War III because someone sends something up and someone else doesn't want it. You, oh yeah, you can imagine India and Pakistan really, really not appreciating these efforts. Well, India and Pakistan would probably appreciate it if you prevented well, the heat from rising. Right, but India wouldn't like it if um, Pakistan did it in such a way that the um, – that the water from the you know the the, the um, Himalayas suddenly stopped flowing, or that the that they altered the patterns of the monsoon, or and and vice and, and vice versa. And, and there's plausible uh, deniability too, which is problematic. And the uh, and the Chinese really wouldn't like it, <laughs> you know, if India altered the monsoon to give it more water, more cool, and that had an impact on on China. And you can imagine that the impact wouldn't be great. Yeah, like when we all play Risk or Monopoly or whatever, there's a board of rules, and you can't break the rules. That's why the game is fun. We don't yeah. have, we don't have those rules internationally, other than standards, which we can kind of cross, especially if you have the biggest military. Right. So yeah, no. So the uh, the book Climate Shock makes, to my mind, a very convincing case that this is something that we should actually really be thinking about, and uh, the the wizards, in a certain way, are more comfortable with this because they say, look. Um, what you can do with this is to buy some time. If you did this properly with global governance, you could reduce 
um, the amount of solar radiation coming in, and you could you could slow down climate change, which would give you time to you know put in renewables or nuclear power or what have you. If you reduce the temperature you know by a degree or so Fahrenheit, you could take the top off of of um, of, of of, of global warming. And so that's a, it's a wizardly solution. It's a techno fix. Um, profits, of course, think this is an abomination. They think it's like trying to put out a fire by putting more gasoline. It's more, you know, it's using more pollution to solve a problem of, pollu of, of pollution. And they would like to see, you know, l much, much larger um, tree planting efforts and so forth. You have these natural carbon eating machines that are called trees and let's uh, plant them in areas that we've deforested. Not only that, but by allowing yourself the flexibility to let the problem continue you're not actually needing to address the problem directly right. and then b what a great business i'm going to start doing this and suddenly you guys are all stuck because if i pull the plug all of the earth is screwed i have an incredible business if someone wants to put a couple billion dollars into getting that started then uh that, that could be a profitable business venture yes uh, you sound like uh, you're you, you'd make an excellent profit Oh wow! Yes. So it's um, it's one of those things. Speaking of, speaking of the future, let's talk about the past. Fourteen ninety one. My understanding is this is a super interesting book, and there's a lot that people don't understand about what Columbus actually came to. So tell me, what was the genesis for this, and what did you find? Well, um, really, uh, as I said, I was a a, a writer for science. And um, I've always been interested in archaeology and uh, and it's, there's been a tremendous methodological, um, almost a revolution in archaeology as all kinds of new technologies come in to let people tease all kinds of new information out about the, uh, about the past. And uh, I gradually realized that people in North America, Central America, and South America were each finding extraordinary new things and had been since the 1960s but because acad academia is very siloed if you know what i mean you know that the the people in one group don't talk to the next group um you get uh the situation which almost nobody knew the entire um picture and nobody realized they're all finding the same kinds of things which is um i sort of summarize it by saying that there were people were here for far longer and here but meaning the americas far longer than previously believed in far greater numbers than previously believed, and they had much greater impact on the environment than previously believed. And so that's the, I wrote the book to talk about that. And we like to write it off because we don't like to think about the other. We don't like to think about the fact that we gave them all smallpox. A little bit of both. Um, I mean, one of the things, that, there was a guy named Henry Dobbins back in the 1960s who really sort of pioneered this, and he pointed out that uh, these diseases, we're talking about smallpox, measles, diphtheria, cholera, you know, all the great um, killers um, that are, that are, that are you know, rapidly spread from person to person didn't exist in the Americas before Columbus. Um, and so in the first 150 or so years after Columbus, it was like the huge amount of suffering and death that had occurred over the millennia in Europe and Asia and Africa from these um, diseases were compressed into this 150 year period. And somewhere between two thirds and 90% um, of all the people in the Americas died. And so when um, many Europeans came to the Americas, the they were coming into a landscape that had been denuded of, of people. They had been, you know, the wilderness that they saw had been created, you know, just a few decades before by these, um, by these diseases, because they sort of exploded through the countryside like chains of firecrackers, not only because the people didn't have any immunity to them, but also literally because uh, the people in the Americas didn't have much infectious disease at all. And so, the idea that you could pass a disease to another, there's a Paiute um, person I, um, who wrote, it was like, we imagined you couldn't pass a wound from one person to another. You know, if I broke my arm, I couldn't give you my broken arm. You know, so the idea of contagion wasn't enough. So what would happen is when these diseases came in, people would get sick. They didn't, of course, nobody in the world had a germ theory of disease or knew what it was. They would see these awful things and people would flee and they would carry the disease with them. Where would they flee? To the next village. The same thing would happen and would go on and on. And so these diseases would go, you know, deep into the countryside where no Europeans were. There's a terrible um, series of diaries from um, the, the Vancouver expedition that was the first 
um, expedition of the British is to systematically survey Puget Sound. And they came just after a giant smallpox epidemic in the 1770s and 1780s. And they just described these empty villages with skeletons on the uh, shore. And that is what many, many um, European colonists came, to, came into. And absent this wave of disease, it's really hard to imagine how small groups of Europeans at the end, you know, poorly equipped at the end of um, very long supply chains could have survived and even thrived in these alien environments. Could people think when they hear these things that one civilization is inherently less sophisticated than the other? But I was reading a great book and they had this concept in there of time travel, which obviously is not mm -hmm. possible. But one thing that the author had in there, which made it much more believable was before traveling anywhere, before doing a hop, you essentially had to get your insides, your outsides, everything scrubbed of any type of possible microbe. Because whether you're mm -hmm. going 200 years in the future or 200 years in the past, you're going to kill everyone because they're not going mm -hmm. to have immunity to what you have. Yeah, and this was basically uh, what happened. There was an epidemiological imbalance between the um, between you know Europe, Asia, and Africa and uh, the, the Americas. And uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, given 16th century knowledge, you know, what could, have, how it could have played out um, otherwise, uh, you know, except if Europeans had said, wow, when we go over there, we're killing people, which they did see, they didn't understand the mechanism, but they did see. I heard they and, passed smallpox blankets intentionally. I mean, that may be incorrect. Well, that, it, 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 that is true from time to time, but the inadvertent stuff was much larger. You can think of it this way, um, that there were some Europeans who, having seen how inadvertent contact had destroyed native civilizations, decided to finish off the few, um, few survivors by passing on smallpox blankets. It's not really might as well, a great if thing. If you're going to do the job, you might as well do it right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So dying civilizations. Not, not a great, uh, not a great chapter. Well, they they bounced, you know, they 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 uh, they, they came back. They, you know, what's really remarkable, actually, if you want to think about it, is that uh, enormous uh, things were thrown at these native societies, and the fact that they're still here um, and still still active is really a, a, an an incredible testament to their vitality. Yeah, you basically got like a hundred plagues at once. What were the, yeah. what were we at population wise? What are the estimates before and after Europeans? Um, well, um, the typical estimates um, of the population in, in the Americas um, today are 40 to 60 million. I, I should note that those estimates keep creeping up. And myself, I wouldn't be surprised. This is just a guess if, you know, finally when it shook out, it didn't come to about 60 or 80 million. And what was and, Europe at the time? Um, Europe at the time was about uh, 90 to 100 million, so very roughly parity. Now, Europe is smaller, so it's denser and so forth, but you're still talking about large populations on both sides. Um, and the uh, by the uh, the nadir, the population nadir was somewhere in the 1890s, 1900 in that in that area, and you're dealing with um, you know a million to two million. So you're looking at it really, really, you know, devastating loss, overwhelming uh, portion of it uh, due, to, due to disease. Wow. That's a, that's a major, major, wow. So, it's the worst demographic catastrophe in human history that we know of. At least it was an accident, I guess, but that's, uh, that's rough. So what, what made you go from that into Wizard and Prophet? Well, th this is going to sound really pretentious, I think, because it is. Um, but I had, so I, I was interested in this. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, one of the lessons of this is that, uh, there are huge environmental consequences of this. You know, much of the Americas was cleared. It was cleared for agriculture and it reverted back to forest. The sort of great wilderness, quote unquote, that was, you know, celebrated by people like Thoreau and John Muir was actually, you know, shaped, by both the presence and then the sudden absence of, of, of human beings. These were, you know, as they say, anthropogenic, human-generated uh, landscapes. Um, and so uh, one of the, I then wrote a book called 1493, which is about the Columbian Exchange. And this is the idea that um, for tens of millions of years, Europe 
Asia and Africa were separated from the Eastern and the Western Hemisphere were separated from each other. Um, and so the plants and animals on both sides evolved. So these ecosystems, you know, evolved separately from each other. And what Columbus really did and his successors was to bring together these ecosystems that had been separate. It was, a, it was an ecological collision. And um, it was the biggest event in the history of life since the death of the dinosaurs and underlies much of human history, that you can see a lot of the human history coming from this environmental uh, collision. And uh, in my mind, I sort of thought it was 1491 is the past, and 1493 is the present, because we're still living in the ripples of that uh, collision. And uh, the new book is the future. You know, what would happen uh, tomorrow? And which camp do you fall into, prophet or wizard? Uh, well, I'm really a wishy-washy. Um, and so I, I find it hard. I also think um, because so much of this about it is about values, um, you know, I, I'm really just telling you, if I say which one I am, what my preferences are. And I think my contribution as a reporter is to tell you what's going on. You know, the moment I, I'm just another guy on the bar stool saying, I think we should have this the minute I tell you what, 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 what I am. And so uh, I sort of hesitate to do that because it brings the discussion to areas in which, um, you know, I, I don't have any special expertise. It's just my preferences. You've called yourself a cynic before. I bet you're a prophet. Well, I, I, I can be reporters get to be pretty cynical um, in the sense that, uh, you know, early on in my career, I suddenly realized that a bunch of the people I were talking to were lying directly right in my face um, in a way that, you know, was, uh, my, my friends, family, and parents never did. And you, you encounter this again and again as a reporter. It does make you cynical, but it doesn't mean that uh, you don't think that there isn't, you know, goodness and truth and justice in the world. And the world is definitely moving in a better place. We have the better, nature, better angels of our nature deal. But at the same time, the polarity is becoming more apparent and... I think the biggest problem isn't necessarily the appearance, it's the speed. How do, we deal, how do we deal with this whole social media, you say something, I see it and hate it, respond, and that spirals out of control? Because I feel like people have lost the ability to take a deep breath and think about things. Um, I'm not sure if I have... Um, I'll tell you what I do. I don't know if this is um, a solution or not. Um, I think a lot about uh, when I was in my 20s, I, I, um, a, a friend of mine recommended um, a book by the philosopher Hans Jörg Gadamer called um, Truth and Method. Believe it or not, I'm actually going to answer your question <laughs> you know, after saying this. <laughs> um, and uh, part of the reason that book struck me so much um, was that I it, it talks about a conversation. You know, what does it mean to have a real conversation with somebody? Um, and it was, you know, how can you have somebody where, where people are expressing what they really believe and in, an, in, a, in, in a way that they are receptive? And that, that's what it you know, means by, by a conversation. And what he talks about is how you have to, that when people approach um, other people, we're not fact evaluating machines you know, we're, we're people. And so what happens, we have our antenna out to see what kind of person, you know, I, I run into you in the street. I don't want to know, you know, what your, what, 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 you know, what the atomic um, weight of cesium is. I want to know, you know, uh, who you are and what you, what you believe and whether you're going to try and drag me into some bad place. Are you a friend? Are you a foe? Or, you know, who are you? And so I have all kinds of antenna out. And I, I, I look at your clothes. I listen to the way you sound, you, you know, right? And, and then if I decide you're a friend, I might be able, willing to listen to you. And um, I think a lot about this uh, when, I, when I write as a, as a writer, and, and part of that is, includes being on Twitter and that, that, that sort of stuff, is what am, I, what am I telling people? And a huge amount of uh, social media communication and, um, unfortunately, journalism is kind of signaling, I am this kind of person, which is uh, often saying, I am on this particular team. And people pick up on that. And that's why, and uh, they're primed to pick up on that, and that's why they react so um, hostilely. So I think a lot about when I write about 
am I telling people this is not for you and you're not who I'm talking about, you know, and I'm, do, do you know what I mean? And uh, if people were more aware of this, I think you might have uh, some of this. I've been very, very lucky in escaping, um, you know, that kind of social media appropriate. And part of it probably is, um, you know, that uh, I'm not a, 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 a you know, a, a, an angry young uh, woman of color who seems the sort who gets these mobs after them. Um, but also part of it is that I, I really do try to think before I, I hit the uh, switch button. What am I saying? Who am I? Who am I? Ta- who, who, what are people thinking about this? You know, going to drive from this? I think if people viewed everything as a statement versus a conversation, I don't ever look at what people reply or post because there's almost no good that can come from that. Yeah. And there's a heck of a lot of bad. I, I actually uh, will. I understand why you say that. In my own Twitter feed, I very often, I almost always read the replies. Um, and the uh, the reason is uh, that every now and then somebody will say, "Hey, what about this paper? Did you read that?" Or, or you know, or they'll say something. I go, "Oh, damn, that was they're right." So uh, so I understand what you're where, where you're where, where you're coming from. I also typically don't spend a lot of time talking about Trump and that sort of thing. I think there's a whole lot of pe- better people than me to talk about him um, and and those subjects. Let's I talk, talk about I yeah, talk speak. about things that I, I try to talk about things that I actually feel like I can contribute and make some difference. Speaking of science, we've had some issues. We'll just that will be the least of the problems. Science has been under attack by people who would consider themselves prophets, but are probably too ignorant to understand the mm-hmm. mechanisms behind the actual prophet argument. So, how do we deal with that? Yeah, it's actually you know. Um interesting the this um i should first tell you that a, a, a possible future guest for your podcast is uh my friend the philosopher robert crease who's just uh, written a bookshop a, a, a book excuse me on this subject called the workshop in the world um and uh you know why why does science denial work and uh and and you know what does it what does it do and how what are the mechanisms um for it and really um a lot of it has to do um, in, in my opinion, and I think in, in his opinion, is the, the sort of rhetorical way that science gets used. Um, you know, uh, you'll, you'll see that in, um, you know, climate change arguments. Uh, you know, this is going to happen, therefore you have to stop driving your car. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, there's a philosopher, Hume, who pointed out that is and ought are two different types of statements. You know that this is going to happen. This is going to happen doesn't mean you. Ought, it doesn't necessarily say you have to do something. Um, and so part of this is that science is used as a, as as a, as a club. Um, and uh, I think I think it's really important not to do to do that. Um, and to separate. And in fact, in the Wizard and the Prophet, when I wrote, wrote the book, I was very tried very very hard to say. This is what's going on, but it doesn't mean you have to do something about it, you know, you, or you have to do this about it or, or, or that about it. Um, for example, it's totally clear that we are going to have some major freshwater shortages. So in some sense, yes, we have to do something about it, but it isn't – the science doesn't tell you whether conservation – and you know, being thriftier and using less is the course, or desalination and making more is is this. that's a value uh, choice. The science can only tell you there's probably not enough. But at the same time, one of the big problems I have is scientists just suck as communicators. So oh yeah, we we they have, always they always violate these rules. We, they always violate these rules. They're, they're the opposite of charisma, and they. Scientists are always looking to prove themselves and others wrong. Well, not always themselves, but generally at least others wrong. That's kind of how they get their cred, so to speak. Right. But when, when you have a situation like that where I don't really want to go out in public, I don't really know how to make a convincing argument, and I'm willing to say that this might be wrong, you kind of just appear... I mean, imagine a politician who did all of those things. It's hard, yeah. even if your opponent is lying their face off, which has happened, it's hard to compete on a charisma sense because human beings aren't motivated by knowledge or fact they're motivated by emotion and feeling yeah 
They are, but also, I mean, the world the world of knowledge, in fact, is is involved. It's interesting. I heard a politician talking exactly about this at the uh, last year at the Denver at the Denver Museum of Science and Nature, and she said, "Look, in the political system we have, it all comes down to a vote. Should I vote for this bill or not? You know, not what is the best thing, but you know, the choice I actually have is this. It's a binary one between this and not this." And uh, she said scientists are very uncomfortable with that because any bill is going to be really, really uh, imperfect and they'll want to amend it. And, and so she said the, the scientists should come in at the very beginning and say, this is what's going on. And then if I want to address it, will this address it You know, at the beginning? And she said that never happens. Uh, the scientists come in at the end when the bill has been crafted and the vote is this and they say it's not adequate. You know, uh, is that chicken and the egg or egg and the chicken, though? Is it that politicians not going to the scientists because they aren't really yeah. active or the scientists not going to the politicians because they're too busy in the lab? Um, she, she said it's think of it this way. If the scientists don't go to the politicians, there are plenty of other people who do. Um, you know, that's the system we have. And yes, you can imagine a. But you need uh, money for that lobbying. Yeah. You need money for that, that, that lobbying. She said, but typically, um, and particularly on the state level, you know, where a lot of stuff that these decisions um, happen. Uh, if you're a state legislator and a guy from the local university who's an expert in that says, I'd like to see it, chances are pretty good they will see you. I'm sorry, you're hearing, you may be hearing a dog barking in the background. Um, and that is uh, my dog. Um, <laughs> They're very important for humanity's survival. We wouldn't have made it here without dogs, guys. Right, who is uh, apparently uh, telling me that the mailman is here or something like this. Okay, he seems to be have stopped. Sorry about that. I, I can, you can cut it out. Ah, no worries, no worries. It's always fun. I think that I, that's part of the reason why I like to have long conversations, not because of the random dog that comes in, but because you've given a TED Talk, and your TED Talk is awesome, but it's like 10 or 15 minutes, and you can't really right. expound upon bigger ideas and Let's face it, we don't have a million people that are going to go out and buy the book. And even no. if they buy the book, that you're not going to get you off the cuff. Off the right. cuff, I think those interesting things happen. What are you interested in the most today? What's either keeping you up at night or has you the most excited? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who, for whatever reason, likes to write. Um, you know, there's a lot of writers who don't. Uh, they like having written. I'm actually a person who enjoys the process, uh, apparently because I have a screw loose. Um, but uh, and so I'm working on a, another book, and it's a it's a pet project of mine. I, I'm from the American West, that's where I was raised, uh, in a small town um, outside of Seattle, and uh, so this is a book about the American West, and um, it was really in a certain way inspired by my son's high school textbook. He's taking uh, American history, and I was looking at his book. You know, it's, <laughs> it's amazing how uninviting textbooks are. Um, this thing is like a thousand pages. Uh, it's like a brick. And so I'm flipping through it, and I realize that in a funny way, the history of the West, you know, the, the land west of the Mississippi that he's getting is exactly the same as the one that I was getting which is exactly the same as the one that my parents were getting. And it was set in motion by this guy named Frederick Jackson Turner. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's the most, um, probably the most important American history, historian who ever lived. That gives you some idea how important historians are, um, that you've never heard of him. And he wrote this uh, article, actually, in the 1890s, uh, called The Significance of the Frontier in the American, American History. And what it is is the book is the article that set the template for a million western movies you know western novels uh, western tv shows and so forth. he kind of created the west not physically of course but this idea that there's a frontier this sort of rolling wave that goes from east to west and on this side is civilization on that side is the wilderness and savagery as he called it and it hits the pacific and then after that the indians disappear nature is tamed and all the focus switches back to the east coast and the west kind of disappears um and you've heard i mean how many times have you seen sort of variations of that idea in the movies oh well, yeah like every, every billion, clint eastwood right? movie yeah every clint eastwood movie right and um the uh my son is learning is pretty much that 
I mean, he, they no longer call the native people lurking savages, but uh, <laughs> which is kind of nice. But it's uh, it's pretty much the same thing. And if you think about it, um, it doesn't bear any re- uh, resemblance to reality, in the sense that uh, it, you know, what do we know about the, what's, what's going to happen in the West uh, 30 years from now? Well, we know it's going to be hotter and drier than it is now. Um, and as the forest fires and fights over water indicate, the idea that nature has been tamed over, over in the West seems pretty absurd. Uh, we know about 40% of the population is Hispanic. They actually, the, a huge movement came from the South. We know that along the Pacific coast, um, there's huge ties to Asia. As, you know, lots and lots of people have come across the Pacific. So the idea that the only movement that mattered was from East to West seems pretty, uh, pretty bonkers. And finally, um, and this is uh, especially interesting to me, uh, the last 30 or 40 years have shown that native groups are on the way back. You know, you can you can see this almost every day. Um, they're regaining um, the sovereignty that was promised to them um, in the Constitution and in various treaties, and uh, they are co-ruling the West. And so 30 years from now, if that, all that continues, we're going to have a very turbulent cultural mixing ground, which is kind of what it was 1,200 years ago when there was lots and lots of little polities, um, and it was much hotter and drier than it is now. So that the picture that you get, you know, almost all Western history books basically start with Lewis and Clark, and uh, uh, a guy I know in the Choctaw called that the period from about 1850 to about 1950 the bad patch, um, which it was for Native people. And he said we're out, we're coming out of the bad patch now, and uh, so there's much more continuity um, and so on. And that's that's what the book's about. The winners write the history books. That's always the problem. Yeah. Right. And uh, but the the winners keep changing. <laughs> the winners do keep changing. Yeah. If we could talk about any topic on the podcast outside of the ones that we've talked about so far, what would it be and why? Huh. I spent a lot of time talking with my wife about architecture and design. I I think that that has a huge role in human society and, uh, and, you know, these sort of invisible systems that, uh, that we have that uh, control our lives. You know, I'm sort of fascinated. These are really boring things. Though, so I don't know if you want to talk about things like building codes and so forth that, uh, you know, nobody knows what they are except for small cadres of professionals. And yet they end up shaping our lives in, in tremendous way. And this is sort of the invisible business of, 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 of government. And uh, I think that a whole lot of the answers to these questions that we're um, been talking and talking about involve these, you know, almost invisible bureaucratic uh, changes that are so boring you can barely even think about them, and yet you know they're, 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 the the cumulative effects ripple out enormously. Complexity screws everyone but the seller. We've got our lawyers making things as funky as possible. We got right. healthcare. Have you ever looked at how they name these different plans? You got the yeah. Anthem Pathway Guided. You got the Anthem HMO. You got the Anthem HSA Guided Pathway. Yada yada yada. Yeah. They the more complex you can make it, the harder it is to reform, and that is in some ways the nature of our government. Let's not get into that right now. Uh, what what um? <laughs> but I I actually I think that that's actually absolutely totally on target. And one of the things that we're going to have to do if we're going to make the food system work better, whether you're a wizard or a prophet, is reach down in this incredible complexity. I mean, like food, the farm bill is mind-boggling uh, what, what's what's inside there. Similarly for water, if you live out in the West, the bureaucratic controls over water and the complex legislation and regulation is, is, is mind-boggling. Same thing for energy. Free markets don't have anything to do with what, in any of these subjects, and uh, yet we have to you know, somehow ra- wrestle with them. In a startup, when something goes wrong, you kill half the team, and then suddenly the team is better, more efficient, more profitable. Mm-hmm. We're probably going to have to do that with government pretty soon because it, it's something that has no, nothing in its nature to lose weight. We just be, it becomes more and more obese. Right. You have, um, and you have things like uh, you know, the, the, the system of water regulations. Um, you, are you in California? I am in Atlanta. Okay, um, so that's that's it. That's, that's it. Okay, and the the system of agricultural regulations in this in the uh, southeast is absolutely staggering. Uh, it, it's something like out of the uh, out of France in the 18th century. These incredibly baroque rules <laughs> that uh, that operate farming and, and forestry and that kind of stuff is really somebody is going to have to deal with it, even though it's incredibly boring. 
Airbnb's terms of service are like a thousand pages. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we got money for the lawyers, right? Let's not get into that, Charles. Let's have let's round this out. If you had one thing you wanted to leave people with, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything. What would it be and why? Oh, this is what I tell um, young people. Um, a lot of these issues that I'm talking about are going to really come to fruition when today's young people, you know, like my daughter, who's uh, in college now, uh, are, are my age, are, are, are our age, I should say. And uh, when um, and, and the extraordinary thing is they're going to set the rules and the systems for generations to come because, you know, the population of the world is going to level out at somewhere around nine or 10 billion and then very, very slowly decline. Most demographers believe that. And so the rules and regulations that are set up for that world of 10 billion are gonna govern us for centuries uh, to come and the choices they make. It's incredibly consequential what they're doing. And uh, so they better pay attention because uh, you know, if, if they're really stupid about it, <laughs> you know, it's, it's gonna last a lot longer than the stupid decisions that my generation made. Especially if we're living longer. Where is the best yeah. place for people to find you, Charles? Um, probably on, on Twitter. Actually, my uh, I have a website, but it was just uh, I'm in a prolonged fight with a guy who hijacked it. So uh, I can't even <laughs> I, may, I, I may just toss in the towel and start a new website. <laughs> just redirect the domain name. Yeah, that's what I'm going to have uh, to do. Then they're screwed. Yeah, it's uh, fun, fun, fun. We'll have links and all that in the show notes, guys. I hope this has been fun. Whether you're a wizard. Oh, or, yeah, whether you're a wizard or a prophet, we're both trying to build a better future. Have a goddamn conversation. And it's probably more likely to happen. Couldn't agree more. Thanks a lot. Bingo. Cheers, guys. Right. Awesome. That was good.